welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Welcome to Syosset Library's Turn the Page podcast. This is Jessica. Um, we are, as of the time that this will air, we are going to be well into summer scares territory. Uh, we're very excited to have our guests here today. Uh, please introduce yourselves and tell us what we are here to talk about. James is the editor. He should go first. Yeah, James, <laughs> you, you go first. <laughs> uh, I'm James Aquilone. I'm the editor of Classic Monsters Unleashed. I'm also the editor of the upcoming Shakespeare Unleashed. That's our follow-up book. And uh, of course, we're talking about classic monsters today. And I'm Lisa Morton. Um, I am a writer of both fiction and nonfiction. My most recent books include um, Weird Women 2, which is a collection of classic ghost and supernatural fiction by women writers, and the collection Night Terrors and Other Tales. That's 21 of my short stories, and um, also Calling the Spirit to History of Seances. That's some pretty cool stuff. So first of all, uh, I just, I wanted to talk a little bit. So there's Black Spot Books and there's Crystal Lake Publishing, correct? Yes. So could you tell us a little bit about both of those? Well, originally this started as a Kickstarter um, and I originally approached Crystal Lake Publishing back at the end of 2020 to do a Kickstarter uh, and they agreed and, uh, we did the Kickstarter and it was uh, much more successful than anyone thought it would be. Um, so during the Kickstarter, we actually got uh, several publishing uh, offers. Uh, so Black Spot came on to uh, handle the print books. Um, and then we also got um, Independent Legions came in and they're going to do they're doing um, an Italian translation of the book. Then we got Blackstone came in and uh, gave us a deal for an audiobook. So um, it was a really crazy 30 days uh, during that Kickstarter <laughs> campaign. And uh, so we ended up with something like uh, like four publishing deals. So it all got very complicated and a lot of people uh, are now involved. And Lisa, would you like to tell us just a little bit about how you started um, with um, horror and your own career? I have always loved horror. Um, I always describe myself as that weird little girl who wanted to be a monster and not a princess at Halloween. Um, and I have been writing horror professionally for about 30 years now. My first short story actually, I think was published 31, no, 30, 30 years ago. Um, and I've published about 150 short stories since then, four novels. Um, and a lot of other stuff. It's just a genre that has always spoken to me. I love the sort of um, exploring and testing our fears um, and that sort of ultimate good versus evil thing always intrigues me. I think that horror has had a real, um, I don't want to say resurgence because I've always thought it was great, but I feel like the pandemic it really flourished uh, it, during the pandemic. Um, for myself specifically, I know that I really ended up just circling back to horror, which I've always loved. Um, so just sort of going back and forth. So James, um, you are focusing on uh, classic monsters and um, could you just talk a little bit about the different monsters that will appear uh, in Monsters, Classic Monsters Unleashed? And just like, why do you think that these monsters are just sort of um, never going to go away? Well, we have we have almost 30 stories. So we, we covered pretty much all of the, the classic monsters. We have Dracula and Frankenstein and the Wolfman, we have even have the, the creature from the back of the although we have to call him the Gill Man for copyright reasons. Uh, we have even Nosferatu and we have uh, the Headless Horseman. 
We have, uh, we even went a little further and we, we've done things like uh, the Mad Scientist and um, Ramsey Campbell did a Count Magnus, a ghost <laughs> story. We even had uh, like a Jack the Ripper uh, type of themed uh, story. So, I mean, the classic monsters, they just stay in the world. They're, they're, they're like, they are the, um, that's where it all started from. And I just think they're like kind of the, the you know, they're the prototype monsters. And, uh, you know, Frankenstein, that's uh, published 1818. You know, it's almost, well, it is 200 years. Uh, and we're still talking about it. And uh, you can, um, like like these stories, you can keep changing them, evolving and, and, and telling new stories. So I, I think that's what keeps them fresh is that they're, they're very uh, malleable, that we can keep, we can, uh, you know, keep creating new stories. and. You know the world is horrible sometimes, so it, you know there is uh, there's always some new monster that we can kind of uh, you know connect with with the old monsters and make something new. Lisa, do you want to talk a little bit about what you decided, what you chose to write about for this anthology without giving too much away? Well, I I got the headless horseman um, as a Halloween expert. That seemed nice. like a choice um, and I was so so thrilled when James asked me to be in the book and um, so when I sat down to write a story about the headless horseman I, I whenever whenever I approach a story where I'm asked to comply with a particular theme I always think first um, about how I can make the story my own I mean how do you take this classic character created by Washington Irving 200 years ago and and make it contemporary, make it speak to modern readers, make it a story that I will feel really connected to, because if I'm connected, the readers will be connected. And so I ended up going in a real, <laughs> very strange direction. Um, I'm really glad that James actually took this story, because for a while I was like, oh my god, this is so weird. <laughs> that go, what the heck is this? But um, and I turned it into a sort of science fiction horror story with a mechanized version of a headless horseman that is exploring fear. Um, it is an AI thing that has been bought by a town to use for their Halloween celebrations. And as it functions and grows, it starts to question, why do people want to test their fears and what am I doing out here? That is so, so, so cool. And um, I am a fan of the Headless Horseman lore myself and have been to Sleepy Hollow Cemetery, which is an extremely cool place. You know, one thing that I found out about just the Headless Horseman in general or just the lore around it was I was unaware until a few years ago that there that there's almost like a similar type of lore from Ireland, I think, about a Doolahan which is another um, headless being that like carries its head. And it was, it's just, it was so cool to me to just sort of see like, okay, so we have this and it, it, we very much, uh, at least I know myself and other people who are fans of horror around New York claim this as our own, but it does sort of show like the transfer of stories and how, you know, you take like a seed of a story and it comes to um, just new places. Yeah, I, I, I don't know the history of the writing of the Headless Horseman, but I know that Washington Irving traveled extensively throughout the British Isles, so that would not surprise me at all. And um, by the way, if you ever want to see some of the best early descriptions of what Christmas ghost storytelling was all about, you can find that in Washington Irving. Yeah, that's actually a whole other thing that we could come back to um, in an episode in December because I think the idea that Christmas ghost stories were really like Christmas was a time to tell ghost stories yeah. and it it's not just a Christmas carol, which really is a ghost story, uh, would be a very interesting topic of discussion. So I'm going to put a pin in that and remind myself to come back to that. Um, so James, um, yourself, like, did you see, I mean, Lisa's idea of an AI headless horseman, that is just so refreshing 
and so cool. And, you know, I think just with the way that science is going, there is a lot of unknown in that. Um, you know, I think like a lot of horror comes from certain things that are unknown. Um, and a lot of, you know, your fears are that thing that you don't quite understand. Um, but I love the idea of taking something old, but then bringing a new fear into it. That's just so cool. Uh, what what are some of the other things that um, readers can expect from Classic Monsters Unleashed? Yeah, we, I mean, we have a pretty w wide range of, um, of ideas of how people, um, you know, dealt with their classic monster. And there wasn't one, I didn't want it just to be like one way to, to approach it. So for some, some people like Jonathan Mayberry, uh, so he did a sequel to Dr. Moreau. So that's, you know, the, the, he, he directly connected that. So like, like Lisa did, it went to a different direction and just did, did, did an update uh, and, and did a sci-fi thing. We have um, Al Golden Back did a Dracula story that's set in the old West. And then we have some people who just totally rewrote uh, stuff like, like, like Frankenstein. So it's kind of, you, you, you're going to get everything in this book because it's, it's basically every which way you could have uh, dealt with classic monsters. There, there, there's, there's a story there. Some of them are more loosely based on, on the classic monster. Um, you know, so it, it kind of goes in, in, in every, every different direction. So, you know, and, and it's packed. This, the book's like 450 pages, so. <laughs> and yeah, the list of authors is just absolutely incredible. You already mentioned um, Jonathan Mayberry, uh, and we know Lisa's in it because we just talked to her about it. But I see Sean and McGuire and I see Linda Addison, who we've worked with several times oh, yes. here at Syosset Library. She's so cool, uh, really good. Uh, it's just like, this is very exciting. I think this is going to be just something that people are going to love. Uh, could you talk a little bit about like the Kickstarter aspect of it and just, some of the challenges, but also benefits of working with a, a Kickstarter model. Well, when I went to Crystal Lake with the idea, well, I had just said I wanted to do an anthology with them. And um, the publisher uh, said, well, we're not doing anthologies anymore because, um, you know, they're hard to sell and they, they don't make money. So I said, well, why don't we do a Kickstarter and we'll, just, we'll raise the money that way. And I said, all right, if you're willing to do that. So that was the way that we, you know, I got to do it because I don't know if we would have, we probably wouldn't have been able to do this or not, not the way we wanted to do it with all the art. I mean, we have um, 10 pieces of interior art here. And um, like I said, we have 30 uh, writers uh, involved. So that becomes really expensive to do an anthology. Um, so, I mean, to do an anthology is probably more expensive to do, say like a novel. Uh, and then the problem is that the anthology probably won't sell as well as like a novel. So that becomes a problem. So doing it through Kickstarter helped us a lot. And since we had a lot of art, that helps to sell it too through Kickstarter. So we ended up make, uh, raising over $57,000 and we ended up being the, um, the highest funded uh, prose anthology ever on Kickstarter. So Kickstarter became, is, is, it really is a great way to, to fund anthologies, especially, I think. And I think anthologies have also been pretty popular. I mean, there's something to be said for having um, a lot of shorter stories within a bigger collection. You know, I think sometimes maybe somebody might be a little... Um, intimidated when they see it, but it's really just a good way to digest uh, stories as a whole. I think, um, you know, just in general, I'm thinking of um, the Dark Stars anthology that was, um, but also just, you know, like when you think about like, or when I think about um, some of the horror I liked when I was younger, you know, like the scary stories to tell in the dark, I don't, even though it technically Alvin Schwartz took the title for it, those all came from classic um, folklore, folktales or urban legends rather. So I, 
I think that this is a good time for anthologies as well. Um, and Lisa, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about, you, you wrote a book called uh, um, Calling the Spirits, A History of Seances. So talk, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I did that book, um, came out about two years ago, and it was my third book for a company called Reaction Books, and my other books for them, the first one was Trick or Treat, A History of Halloween, the second, the second one was Ghost to Haunted History, so they actually came to me a couple of years ago with the idea of doing a book about the history of seances, and because I'd already done the ghost book, I said, oh yeah, I, I could absolutely do that, that'll be an easy segue, and it was fascinating to research and write. Um, I learned so much that surprised me. I think most people don't really understand what the seance was like when it was born. It was came out of the mid 19th century spiritualist movement. And it was not, I, I think our idea of the seance now has been defined by horror movies. We think it's, you know, a very scary thing. It was not at all when it started, it was joyous. Um, it was like a party. It was also like a magic show. People went to be entertained and to have their sort of sense of wonder invoked. Um, it didn't seem to matter to them that these mediums were all frauds. <laughs> and, and that was a surprising aspect to me that the mediums were all continually exposed as frauds. And yet the people who um, were spirits spiritualists just were absolutely unwavering in their belief that these people could contact the spirits and and it was really interesting to read how they would jump through these crazy logic pretzels to try and maintain their belief um the most standard answer was oh no no they're absolutely genuine just that one day their powers didn't come through and they had to fake it interesting so, it was it was a fascinating history and it was interesting jessica that earlier you mentioned horror being popular during the pandemic because at the start of the pandemic i predicted a huge rise in paranormal belief because that we can trace that throughout history every time there's some kind of massive global traumatic event like a war or yeah. a plague we see a spike in paranormal belief is there actually a way to sort of also um tie that to the idea of monsters um james uh you know like the times when all of these various classic monsters first started to emerge um historically did they come about during um times of conflict when the original authors who popularized them uh create uh, quote unquote created them um, I mean, they were all created at different times. So, I mean, I would guess so. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, like what, what Frankenstein, like I said, 1818, I don't know what was going on back then. <laughs> or uh, yeah. uh, Bram Stoker's like 1890s. But I think there's always, uh, you know, there's always something going on in the world. Yeah. And um, I mean, even that was like kind of the way I got into monsters for, for my own fears. I, I really was afraid as a kid of zombies. I mean, they scared the hell out of me when I was yeah. like, I was when I was eight. If you remember Chilla Theater in New York, we had like the, on WPIX. Um, they were playing uh, children shouldn't play with dead things, and I, I was watching this at like eight, and it scared the hell out of me. And at the end of the movie, the zombies get on a boat, and I think they're getting on a boat coming to New York. And and I, I remember asking someone like, where are they coming? And they go, and they and somebody in my. Uh, how so? Oh, they're coming here. They're coming. And I was just terrified. So I never watched an another zombie movie until I was like in my 30s. Really? Yeah. I well, think wait, wait, went... wait. What zombie <laughs> did you watch in your 30s? Now I need to know. Uh, 28 Days Later was like the first time I, I sat down and watched. Well, I went to the theater. We, had, we got free tickets. And I, I think I ended up watching it. I was like, wow. That, and, okay. Well, that was when we had this whole resurgence in, in zombies right. back then. It was uh, the new Dawn of the Dead and, and, and um, 28 Days Later. So then I was like, oh, well, then I, I, then I fell in love with zombies. And then I, and now I write a series about, you know, a, a zombie detective. So, so I think a lot of that, oh, I, I mean, I, I would say a lot of, if not all horror writers probably are, are, are you know, working through their own fears, yeah. you know, and, and it's usually better if you, you are writing about your own fears. So I, I, I would think then like in a time of turmoil that you, 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 you'll see more of that and you'll, you'll probably see more, um, you know, monsters being created. 
I, right. I don't know. Maybe we're going to see more virus, virus related monsters, probably, you know. Um, I mean, the whole, the whole, um, and it's not a classic monster, but I feel like um, it's kind of taken on the, the almost like the um, role of one recently by recently i mean the last two years is just the image of the plague doctor you know yeah. you the plague doctor the first time i remember seeing just the image it was just so terrifying and you know you you talked about you know plagues in the past and um but it really does have like the, you know, the distorted um, features and something unseen behind it. And right. it does have like that feel, but you're also going into like Barnes and Noble and there are giant stuffed plague doctors. And yeah, that's, that's so creepy. Like, it's so crazy. Said, now, now that I think of it, Mary Shelley uh, they were in uh, Switzerland. They they were they were hiding. They were running from. There was a plague or something, I think. And that's when they were they were holed up in um, wherever they were. And that's when they wrote this the story, right? I think that was that was that was, was the what was going on at that time. But there actually there actually was a world calamity going on, but it was a volcanic eruption, um, and they uh, it covered much of Europe with this massive cloud, and, and it was very cold that summer, and um, Mary and Percy Shelley and Lord Byron and, and John Polidori were all holed up in the Via Diodati at the, right. um, on Lake Geneva, yeah, so there was a world calamity, but it was this volcanic eruption and I, they call it the summer of I'm trying to remember what the exact yeah the yeah the year without a summer yeah. I was just looking that oh, okay. up the year without a summer 1816 right. yeah yeah I so right. I think this is like the perfect time for a book like this to come out um and I think that the stories are just going to be absolutely right. wild again like this this is just such a great collection of authors how did you decide um who to reach out to or who should be involved um some of them were people that i've worked with before i mean i mean i just go with you know people who, whose work i admire and and like my own uh, like writing heroes you know like joe lansdale is like always the guy i usually reach out to because he's one of my favorite writers uh i've known lisa for a while i think uh, uh even back when i was blogging i I think I interviewed you uh, uh, once or twice, um, and then uh, through Weird Tales, I'm uh, the managing editor of Weird Tales, so I worked with a bunch of the, the same people uh, there. And uh, some people reached out to me and uh, said, "Hey, uh, once once the the book was public, I, I had a lot of people reach out to me, so I, I got people that way. That, so that's a lot easier when they just you know message me and say, "Hey, I want to be in this book, and I, or I have this idea for a, for a story." So um, it was not hard getting people for this book. Uh, I think almost everybody I reached out to uh, said yes. I think I only had like, like one or two people who were like scheduling conflicts who, who said no. So that was easy. It was very easy to put this book together. Because there, were, so, as soon as I said, we're doing new stories on classic monsters, but everyone was like, I'm in. Yeah. So that was very easy, yeah. <laughs> so what's Shakespeare unleashed? So Shakespeare Unleashed is a uh, horror stories, uh, you know, based on Shakespeare and, and, and his plays. So I thought um, that would be a really cool uh, idea to do that. Uh, and uh, I've always been a big fan of Shakespeare. And, and I think Shakespeare really lends itself well to uh, horror. But then we also have some people doing, um, you know, the comedies as, uh, as horror stories. So I thought that was really cool too to take like Shakespeare and like I like I've never I mean people have done it in the past, but I, I you know, but I thought it was a cool idea to take Shakespeare and do like a short story, you know, based on on Shakespeare. Yeah, I was going to ask, are we going to see any like Falstaff horror stories? <laughs> because that um, would be interesting. I don't think anyone picked that yet, but we 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 have all the major um plays I think except for Romeo and Juliet strangely enough um and we have we're gonna I think we're gonna have at least one that's gonna be written like as a play because Ian Dosher I, I think that's how you say, say his last thing he does he's he, he does this he does um 
he does like Star Wars as Shakespeare and he's done oh, Marvel. Oh, that is, he's Avengers. fabulous. Yes. Yeah, so he, it's those I think through like quirk books or something. The, yeah, yeah. Those are yeah, so, so he, cool. He, he like Shakespeareizes uh all of these other um, you know, books and, and stuff. So I so, said, oh, I gotta get him. So thankfully he said yes, and he's gonna do um Twelfth Night. But he's gonna he's gonna write it, you know, as you know, like in I I am the pentameter. Oh, that's like, so that's, cool. I feel like Twelfth Night would be very good <laughs> for that, especially because um even though they're very, I guess, um, you know, there's like different schools of thought about what, you know, the fairies are and like I think a lot of people like to think, you know, like fairies, pretty, but like really original fairy lore is yeah. pretty scary. <laughs> Lisa, just, are you are you involved in that one at all? I am. Yeah. When when James came to me, he showed me a list of who had already taken what plays, and I was absolutely astonished that no one had taken Titus Andronicus, which is you know just a massive gross out and seriously I, I, I gotta have that one but I, I am to me the most interesting aspect of that play is the failure to do to give any agency to Lavinia who is the victim throughout so I'm gonna be doing a little bit of a reversal there <laughs> <laughs> awesome um was there anything else we wanted to talk about before wrapping up no um, so if people want to grab Monsters Unleashed, Classic Monsters Unleashed, um, where will they be able to find it? It should be available everywhere. I mean, right now you can pre-order it on, on Amazon. I, I believe it's also on Barnes & Noble. Um, you can probably pretty much find it anywhere. I mean, you can go to my website, monstrous, monstrousbooks.com, and uh, there, there are links there for it. Well, I'm really excited for it. Um, this has been really fun. And um, yeah, so once again, this was Jessica with Syosset Libraries Turn the Page podcast. My guests were James Aquilone and, and Lisa Morton. And we are going to close this chapter. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.